Uh, is anybody else here? Hello? It's going round and round. It hasn't made up its mind. Yes, hello, it's going round and round. <laughs> Has it loaded? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Hello, everybody. That's Paulina chasing me, as is as she should. Good evening. Welcome to the BSFA Vector Reading Series. I'm on first. I'm Jeff Ryman. I'm sure you're all waiting for Steve Orham as well. Uh, I'm going to be uh, reading a, a ghost story now, and I'm going to be doing that. We've just been all thanking the NHS, I hope. I'm reading the ghost story to thank Ian Waits. He uh, invited me to take part in an anthology of London stories, and this is a London story. And uh, he also publishes some terrific people that I love and respect, like Justina Robson, Nick Wood, Kat Hellison, on and on. So this is partly for all those people who invest their time and their money in providing us all with uh, a place to publish and indeed to be able to say, I don't say this is good, somebody else says this is good. Um, while we're waiting for everyone to foregather. Uh, I, I'm a kind of convert recently, enthusiastic convert to horror. Uh, partly I think it's somewhat like the situation we're in, which is not a very nice situation, it's an extreme situation. And lo and behold, we're all finding it's um, the situation is refocused our minds on nurses and people in uh, in shops or who are delivering goods or who are collecting garbage. Very suddenly, the horrific and extreme events make us appreciate the everyday more. And I think horror is its great strength, actually is the way it deals with character and setting and ordinary life. I always quote that bit in It by Stephen King. There's a two-page description of the contents of a hypochondriac's uh, medicine cabinet. And we've known this hypochondriac since the 1950s. And he's kept every single bottle. And the medicine cabinet, it goes on for two pages just summarizes America's relationship to advertising, its pharmaceutical relationship to pain, its very, very weird uh, relationship to itself. And it's just a brilliant piece of writing that we probably wouldn't be interested in if something nasty called it wasn't lurking around the corner. So I think possibly we're foregathered are you all sitting comfortably? <laughs> I hope not. I'm going to read you a ghost story. It's called <clears throat> Something Went Wrong in Heaven. I don't know if it's in the London Anthology yet, but here's hoping. And uh, I'm just going to start now. Um, about half of its length is all about London, all about the two characters. I'm not going to read you all that. I've edited it down. We're just going to start. We've had a description of London. We've had a description of the two main characters as well. And I'm just going to start at this point here. I just trust Tottenham Court Road, getting back from the Tesco. A particularly worn, thin person intercepted me in the zebra crossing. They held out their arms as if for a hug their mouth in a sideways twist. For just a moment, I thought it might be somebody I knew who'd fallen on hard times, perhaps one of the old Montague Square crowd. Then they began to call out a name. Tony, Tony, it's me. My name isn't Tony. I once worked in an office with two other Edwards, so everyone called me Bob for two years of my working life, but never Tony. Sorry, mate, wrong Tony. I tried to look twinkly, old and swift. I tried to hobble round him. Please, 
Please, they said, and started to sob. I don't know where I am. What is this place? This was not going to be someone I could help. They kept pace with me, pinching my sleeve as if they were picking off a lint. They wore gloves, woolen ones with no fingertips, as if they had to count change in the age before central heating. The fingernails were black with dirt. Their boots were heavy and rounded at the top, and their black coat had this huge high color. When I say there was a smell, pl please don't misunderstand me. It wasn't a body smell. It, it was acrid, but acrid in a different way. It smelled like carbon steel might after a jolt of electricity. I tried to throw off their hand and I, I finally looked into their eyes. It, it, it wasn't a human face. All the constituent parts were there, but they were dead hanging. Don't, don't leave me. Don't leave me here. I'm not Tony. I wanted everyone around me to know that I'd been accosted, that I had done nothing to this person to make them weep, that I was the one who was in trouble. They grabbed hold of my hand. Their grip was feeble, like, like a shadow. But icy cold, cold as deep space, cold that turns oxygen into snow. I squawked and I shoved instinctively and the thing seemed to weigh nothing. It, it slid back on its heels and then fell backwards. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I said to the winter faces all around me. He, he wouldn't leave me alone. An unmoved, pudgy young woman frowned at me. First off, I think you'll find that's a woman you've knocked over. She grabbed hold of me. Oh, wanted help, did she? What was your problem? Frightened you were gonna have to give up a pound? <sighs> she shook her head and turned to help and then went blank. There was no one there. Just wet, glossy pavement. I got back to our flat. Inside was roaring hot. Alf feels the cold badly, but sometimes I can't breathe when he's had the heating up all day. He was in his chair by the window, a blanket over his knees. He doesn't like to wear trousers at home in case he has to make a break for the loo. It takes him five minutes to get there, so any extra time lowering the bum bags might <clears throat> lead to a crisis. He wasn't alone. A sweet-faced, young black man, lovely smile, everything else in circles, was talking to him in a London accent, and I remembered Alf had said someone was coming today to deliver his new glasses. Alf introduced me as his partner, and the optician smiled. The optician was called Barnabas. I offered Barnabas tea. He was mid-thirties at the oldest. His Shirt tucked in, his leather shoes polished, he looked a little bit like a traveller in time. Alf had the daffiest grin on his face, and his eyes looked dazzled. Barnabas was slipping the glasses on. So, are these firm enough for you, Professor Davies? Oh, oh very firm, thank you, but oh, everything's looking rather bold. Alf flicked a complicit smile at me. Somebody had a crush. That's because they're new glasses and you're wearing them with your old contact lenses. Let's see if the eyes adjust. If, if you don't, we can get you new lenses. <laughs> Alf looked like he was on a roller coaster ride. Handsome young black men are Alf's opposite sex. He really should have married one of them instead of me. But back in the early 1970s, when we were both students at Sussex, there were precisely three gay black men in all of Hove, Brighton, Eastbourne, and New Haven combined. Two of them were each other's cousins, and one of them was my boyfriend, Andrew. And we get a summary of the relationship with Andrew, who was quite a character, and his mum, and his relationship with the famous painter Duncan Grant, 
Eventually, Andrew runs off with a Canadian diplomat with a ja Jamaican wife, and they have a delirious threesome. But that leaves Teddy and Alf to sort things out. <clears throat> Alf and I had met working on the uni literary magazine. We thought we were hippies. We wanted white rabbits on the cover. Someone much smarter than we were said that Art Deco was coming in and insisted on the cover that looked like a, a barbershop pole with headlights. We went to the student bar to plot against him. I got a bit drunk and told Alf that Andrew and I had broken up. I wasn't stupid. I'd seen how Alf had been looking at him. To my surprise, Alf took my hand in his. I'm not sure he was nice enough for you, he said. Alfred wore a cravat in 1972, spoke posh and had a quizzical expression. He really did look like someone from my father's generation. <laughs> and so here we are, suddenly. We've been together 48 years and he's still yearning for a black bosom on which to lay his head. At the front door, I shook Barnabas's hand and thanked him. Take care of each other, he said. My, how times have changed. And we got a long section about the two cousins in Brighton, how one of them died of AIDS. We learned that Teddy has been tape recording Alf and his memories because he suspects Alf is on the way out. And so we get an awful lot about their life together and indeed how it was being gay in the 70s and early 80s um, and going to the theater and people staring at you and going to demonstrations when British home stores starts firing all its gay staff. Um, and then back to the characters and the story. A few days after Barnabas had visited, Alf said, rather more often than usual. More of what? I said. Them, the walking dead. <laughs> that was our nickname for the homeless. Our street is a backwater between two parallel thoroughfares. You sometimes get homeless people on the march to keep warm or to escape boredom. They shout at each other, harsh and angry and incomprehensible. Oh my goodness, that one's in a bad way. Someone in a voluminous black dress and button-up boots was sitting down in the middle of our road. A bit early to be that drunk, I said. Oh, it's never too early to be drunk, said Alf, who's taken up self-medication in a big way. Oh, my goodness! The woman had lain out fully flat in the middle of our street. We can't leave her there. Someone might drive over her. I sipped my coffee. Alf seemed to fight the chair he was sitting in. Well, I can't go down myself, can I? Alf never complained, but he was irascible. Every time you want to do something, I'm the one who has to go and do it. Well, fine, let someone drive over her. Maybe you'll do the same for me sometime. He was a master of blackmail. All right, Alfie, all right. I was a master of bad grace. I found my shoes, found my coat, couldn't find my keys, and so asked Alfie where they were. Well, you put them last, I expect. So I finally got downstairs, and of course, when I got there, the woman was gone. He goes back upstairs. They see more and more strange people on the street. Teddy goes on to new media and asks, and People have various responses. Somebody sends him a photograph from South Shields of someone wearing a 1960s Butlins uniform. And then Alfie returns to normal. We're out of sherry, said Alfie. Are you going out? I just got back in. No, no urgency, just, just when you're going out. I sighed. I got the bloody guardian coupons if you don't get to the shops before 11 there's no newspapers anyway you can walk miles trying to find one i'll go now oh yes do you remember hill's news agent on Bridge street eh they delivered delivered newspapers oh it's unthinkable now they were rather hunky 
the Hills brothers. Then, but punky, they were bald and spectacled. They had muscles. So did lady wrestlers, but I hope you don't fancy them. For a time in the 1980s, Good Street also had a cheese shop with a walk-in chill cabinet. And for a while, there had been wonderful Harry. Harry was an old Billingsgate hand in a long white jacket and tweed cap. Fishy water spilled down from the ice on his barrow. And you could buy sea bass or mullet or whatever looked good that day. He knew our favorite fish and saved them for us, usually turbot. And suddenly Harry stopped being there. I have no idea how many years ago now. Well, to find a guardian, I had to walk quite far along Good Street. It must have been the spring weather bringing them all out. A young man, face as finely boned as a greyhound's, blocked my path. He wore an orange and yellow checked sports jacket with oddly padded shoulders from a skip, probably. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I hate to ask. I was wondering if you could spare some change. He looked in a bad way, so I dug into my pocket. I'm an actor, really. I, I went to America for a while and, and came back. A, a bit difficult to get parts. Quite so. He stank and had no teeth. Well, blackened stumps. If I was wealthy, I might pay for his dental work. As it was, I fished out a two-pound coin. He stared at it as if he'd never seen one. Then he shook his head and gave a sick laugh and pushed it back into my hand. The coin was icy. Almost at once, a child accosts him, asking for money. He gives the child a two-pound coin, and then at once, another child, this one in bare feet, starts crying because he gave money to one child and not to him. And then a very old-fashioned Bobby with a tall, hard hat tells the old uh, tells him to hop it and uh, rescues him from the child. I walked on, and now a man in a suit stepped in front of me. My God, am I wearing a sign that says "Stop this man"? This one was wearing a pinstripe suit. Airily amused, he said, "Excuse me, I, I think I've misplaced a hospital." He, he sounded ludicrously posh, like someone in the 1950s making fun of a royal. You wouldn't believe it, but I can't find the Middlesex Hospital. It, it's where I work. It's gone. The Middlesex. Lovely, huge old pile with murals and a chapel inside. Luxury flats now has been for years. Though they managed to leave the chapel standing as a design feature. How long had this man been away? I mean, how had he come back? His rigid collar had rounded tips. Had there been an escape from a lunatic asylum? I mean, lunatics it might be a bit hard to spot in the West End. Even then, I didn't get it. The woman I'd seen lying down in our road was now stretched out on the pavement opposite the shoe repair shop. Alf had wanted me to see if she was okay, and Alf is a prince about anything important. <laughs> Impossible about small things like table settings and music, but his sense of kindness is unerring. I leaned over her and asked, Are you all right? She was not wearing a trace of makeup. She seemed to have no eyebrows or eyelashes. She was pale, with blue veins in her translucent but freckled cheeks. Her lips were cracked and pale. Her red hair had escaped a kind of winding around her head. She stared up, straight up, at the sky. For some reason that made me look up too, and the sky was silvery, full of both light and cloud. Take me back she said, but not to me. Take me back. Well, <clears throat> he limps back from the newspaper shop, runs across a few more of the apparitions, gets to Charlotte 
muse. And standing there where he always used to be, who do you think I saw? Harry. In his white coat with the barrow, and it was running with ice water, I have to say the fish did smell a bit off. Harry! Harry, how are you? Is that you? Hello, Gov. <laughs> yeah, I've been back a while. Moved the bloody market, haven't they? Billingsgate, it's not there. Well, <laughs> I know I've been off work for a while, but not that long. He gave a smoker's chesty laugh. Sorry the merchandise isn't up to my usual standard. Oh, let me have a look. The prof will be thrilled. Some of your lovely fish. I wouldn't let you buy it, Gov. For the punters, maybe, but not for you. But how is the prof? Is he still with us? I haven't seen him around. Well, he's, to be honest, Harry, he's, uh, he can't get about much these days. Well, I always warned him. All that cycling can't be good for you. How are you, Harry? We, we thought maybe you'd been ill. Oh, I was, I was, but that's all over now. I'm here, right back where I belong. It's lovely to see you after all this time. I wanted Harry to have a home, a place to be. You had a daughter, I remember, a grown-up daughter. Are you staying with her? Mm, no, no. You could say I stick to my old haunts. He looked about him at the street. The place has changed. Oh, Harry, you don't know the half of it. Of all the old shops, I think only Tesco's left. Schmidt's, the big German restaurant on the corner, with the woman on the till. Remember, with the moustache. Gone. Do you remember Lawton's sandwich bar? <laughs> oh, those bloody soggy pita bread with flabby ham and too much salad. Yeah, they always broke apart, remember? Always coleslaw all over your lap. Well, but Giggs is still with us. Giggs? Those two old men. Well, the young sons took over and turned it from a kebab shop into a proper sit-down Greek restaurant. Kleftko? Ratzina? The lot. Mind you, they're not so young themselves these days. And Pollux, the toy museum opposite them. That's still there, surely. I couldn't remember. It's so clear in my memory, but, you know, I think it's gone as well. Oh, dear, he said, and looked even sadder, and then froze, staring ahead. Oh, lovely to see you, Harry. I, I have to get on. The, the prof will be wanting his newspaper. Good to see you back. He didn't answer. I really had to get home. I'd never been so cold. It, it seeped right through my thick cloth coat. Harry just nodded, and it seemed to me his skin, his hair, even his eyes got whiter. I turned and walked away with misgiving, as naturally as ice melting, as gently as a daffodil blooming. Realization came as to who, or rather what, I'd been talking to. That had not been Harry. If it had been just him alone, I might have said to myself, Teddy, I think you've seen a ghost. <laughs> but all of them, all of these homeless people, in bowler hats, shawls, button-up boots, mutton sleeves, straw boaters, all of them ghosts? Beyond the T-junction with Good Street, Tottenham Court Road was full of some kind of procession. No cars. Outside the Tesco, two Japanese or Chinese tourists in face masks asked me, is it protest? No, no, it's not that. I'm not sure what it is. The sky swirled. There was an odd golden light. I had to get back to Alfie. To do that, I had to cross Tottenham Court Road. Thousands of them filled it. A solid moving wall like a caravan of refugees. Some in bowler hats or huge ladies millinery. 
broad brimmed with flowers. Some men wore snazzy Colombo madmen hats. One of them, in this cold, wore only Bermuda shorts and an Hawaiian shirt. From far down Charing Cross Road, there was the sound of beeping. I stood on tiptoe but saw nothing. I learned later that cars and vans had been caught up in it. Cars fascinated them. The drivers couldn't move, but scores of curious, dirty faces pressed up against the window glass. A woman ran up to me in a cloche hat and a shapeless dress in a zigzag pattern. Have you seen a little girl? I can't find my little girl about five years old. She was just here. She was just here. Her face was puffy from crying. How many years has she been gone? I asked, rather in a trance myself. She ran on. Another woman in a fluffy pink coat, pill box hat, stiletto heels, grabbed hold of me and shouted into my face, There's somebody else in my home! All my things are gone! All my books, my photographs, my LPs, my paintings, my papers, all gone my whole life! I did not say, that's what happens when you die. When my mother followed my father, I had to dismantle their home, throw out most of their things. The ashes of her favorite dog, her mink stole, and every copy but one of my father's articles. I have to call the police. Is, is there a telephone kiosk near here? I almost told her that there are no kiosks any longer, and then I didn't. I lied. Further up Totten Court Road. Thank you. I, I don't suppose you have a shilling? No. That was the truth. Terribly sorry. I was nearly out of the press of them when another woman plucked my sleeve. She stared, stared ahead, her face covered in ash. She was wearing only one shoe and her clothes had been shredded. Could I trouble you? She asked. I, I'm afraid I can't see anything. Were you caught up in a bomb? I asked gently. Her head moved up and down. Perhaps. I had an idea. Try, try to remember what you most typically wear, your, your, your favorite outfit, say. Perhaps you and your friends are going out to a dance. It worked. <laughs> her face was clean and her hair was in a home perm. She had on a brown tweed coat with a little butterfly brooch and a pleated skirt and heeled shoes that laced. <laughs> Thank you, she said, and gave a throaty, naughty laugh. With a blood red smile, she said, leg of nothing. Her breath was arctic. They walked into me, bumped me to one side, spinning I could move between them. I spun into Chenny's Street and then hopped and skipped as fast as I could. No traffic in Chenny's Street. The procession had blocked any entry by cars. I turned left into the gardens and children were playing there with hoops. One little girl in a frothy white dress and hair ribbons. Outside our front door with an arm full of fresh cut flowers, Alfie, I remembered that I hadn't gotten his sherry. He was dressed in his old suit, the fawn one. I'd forgotten that suit. He gave a forlorn little wave and a rueful smile. I was struck again by how dapper and dashing he could be. Then I felt my arms prickle. Alfie, what are you doing out? Get inside. The cold is terrible out here. It is cold he said, and looked at the trees, just misting over with green. It's a lovely day, though. Not quite yet spring. He looked into my eyes. I'm so sorry, Teddy. His legs weren't swollen and his feet were straight. I, I think it's more difficult to go when there's someone else there. I think they just hold you, just their mental presence, psychically. That when they leave you alone, it's easier to slip away. 
Oops. Alfie? What the hell was he talking about? He shrugged and laughed. Anyway, I've gone and done it now. I'm so sorry. The key shivered in my hand as I tried to jam it into the front door. I bounded up the stairs like I used to when I was 23 and we just moved in. And I flung open the door and found him sitting at his window with his blanket around his legs and the gas fire blazing and his morning sherry not touched. The doorbell rang. It was Barnabas looking happy. Barnabas, the optician. Hello, Professor Davies wanted me to look in with some contact lenses. He's gone! He's gone! He's gone! He's gone! His face went still and calm. May I come in? What am I going to do? To my amazement, he took me in his arms. He hugged me and I didn't mind. I, I didn't feel accosted. May I see him? I must have nodded yes. I couldn't speak. Barnabas came in with the silence of a cloud. He took Alfie's hand in his and then he made him sit up straight. He got him into his trousers, which took half an hour. The legs were so swollen and purple. I didn't know what to do or say. Barnabas recited a psalm, the right words. I can call people for you, he said. I visit a lot of older people. He rang the police and asked me for our tax code and rang the tax people and our GP. He found a funeral agency. They would be here for the body soon. Do you want me to wait with you? I found I did. I wasn't used to being alone. I hadn't been alone for 48 years. I made him tea. Earl Grey can't stand the stuff myself. Too much bergamot. My parents are Igbo, he said. The dead are not demons. Some of them are our family. They are us. No better, no worse. Nothing to be afraid of. Well, I have nothing to do these days but sit and watch. I can see a corner of Gower Street, just a wedge of it through our window. It's their encampment. A few of them wander up and down. Most of them are just sitting in the road, just staring. The authorities have tried to curious them, but nothing clears them. Maybe they got tired of being forgotten. Mrs. King is chatting with neighbours outside our front door. She lived in the flat opposite when we first moved in. Mrs. King was a dear, always telling jokes and making the best of things. She stopped me being frightened of old age. I think that something has gone wrong in heaven. Some kind of war. Or maybe it just got too full. Maybe that's what scares us about the dead. They're refugees, homeless. Mrs. King is nodding and laughing at something Alfie said. He rocks back and forth on his heels like he always did and looks up and gives me a salute like he used to on George's boat. He's waiting for me. That's it, folks. End live video.